Morning, it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 11.20 on Friday, the uh, 6th of May here in New York. Um, my topic, the presentation is called Fatal Market Hyperbole. And uh, that's sort of what I'm gonna be talking about today. I would love to talk about the real silver market and the real gold markets today. I know that that's what most of our viewers really appreciate is when we talk about substance. Uh, but I'm afraid I will not, and I'll probably run out of time and not talk about it too much at the end, but we talked about it Tuesday, pretty obvious what's going on and what our views are. This is a chart actually from our Silver Year book, which will be released on May 10th, next Tuesday, and you can go to our website and you can register for a 10 o'clock online uh, briefing on the Silver Year book and you can pre-order the book so that you'll get the ebook when it's released on Tuesday, the 10th of May. This is a chart going back to 1970 of silver bullion inventories. And you can see the big blue area is implied unreported stocks of silver bullion. And this is data obviously that we have been maintaining and estimating since 1970. There are a lot of uh, qualifications that you really need to understand of this, and those things are spelled out in detail in the Silver Yearbook, as they have been for 40 some odd years, uh, and it, it, it's information. And then you can see this green part, which is actually coins, uh, and coins you can see starting around the mid 1980s when the US and Canadian uh, Mints started public, uh, producing bullion coins. Coins slowly became the preferred medium uh, for investing in silver. And then there was this radical change in the mid aughties when coins became it. And part of that reason was that the price of silver started rising in 2005, 2006. And it had been trading between say 350 and 550 uh, from, 1990 into 2005, and it rose above 550, and it rose to $10, and then it rose even higher. And at that point, a 1,000 ounce bar, which was had been the preferred medium for a lot of investors, became uh, expensive. And so, with the availability of coins, you saw people moving into coins. About the same time, you also had the creation of silver ETFs. And you started seeing a lot of people selling thousand ounce bars and replacing them with ETF shares and or coins. And so really starting around 2005, as the price was rising, as an investors were beginning to rebuild their inventories that they had drawn down from 1990 to 2005, investors and others, uh, there was a couple hundred million ounces that came out of bank inventories in the early 1990s, but between 1990 and 2005, there were net sales of about 1.3 billion ounces of silver bullion, mostly by investors, but also by um, banks that had built up inventories as the market makers or buyers of last resort in the late 1980s. Uh, <clears throat> 2005, you start seeing investors rebuilding their positions and their preferred media were ETFs and coins. And that has continued to this day with coins being the dominant uh, preferred method of investing in silver. That's the kind of information that's in the silver yearbook. It's, a, it's, a, it's full of information about the real silver market, supply, demand, investment demand, prices, inventories, uh, and market trends. But I'm not gonna talk about that today. We will be releasing it on May 10th, and I hope that you all join. It should be about 230 uh, pages of, of information. Today, I'm somewhat bothered by a range of misrepresentations, um, mostly conscious efforts at lying people. And they range from politics to the economy, to inflation, to the war in Ukraine, to gold and silver. And as much as I would like to talk about substantive things, I just feel compelled today to focus some on some of the distractions that cost investors money. I gave a speech in 2008 
in which I said that conspiracy theories were distractions that cost investors money. And there were certain people who were conspiracy theorists, marketers, who took obsession, uh, objection to that. And I said, look, because you sit there and you say uh, as an investor, oh, I bought silver at $10, it's $25 now, but you know, this guy on the internet says it's going to 50 or 100 or 1,000 or 1,500. So the price goes to 30 or 40 or 50. And you say, it's going to 1,000. I'm not going to sell it at 50. And then you know the next week, it falls back to $33. And you say, gee, I guess I should have sold it at 50. That's a distraction predicated on nonsense that costs investors money. And we've had investors who had done that in 2011, April of 2011, when the price went from $36 to $50 over the course of April. And we were saying, this is a function of what's going on on the COMEX with the May contract rolling forward. Investors are not buying a lot of silver. Some investors are actually selling their silver and taking profits. Uh, you should sell your silver or buy puts. Uh, because once the May roll is behind us, this price is going to come back down to $36. And we were wrong. It went to $32 or $33 in the first week of May. So that is a distraction that costs investors money. And a lot of uh, marketeers of conspiracy theories took objection to that. And I talked a little bit in that presentation about one guy who has been saying that there's this massive short position in the silver market since the 80s, he had been a broker at Drexel who was caught by the CFTC uh, trying to, well, un, un, pooling client money without the client's permission and then using that money to try to squeeze the frozen and concentrated orange juice market. And Drexel paid a fine for non-supervision of him and, and the CFTC came down hard on him. He was banned from being uh, in the business of futures and options. So he immediately started telling, first he's told the CFTC, oh, you know, I was at Drexel and Drexel was squeezing the silver market and they have this massive short position and you should investigate Drexel and be more lenient on me. So the CFTC, CFTC did in fact investigate Drexel. They found a two match trades with a refiner which were actually trades that were undertaken in order to have a hedged book at the end of the day because the banks that provided Drexel the financing for their precious metals books said, you go home hedged every day. You don't have naked short or naked long positions. And so CFTC said, no, nah, that's not enough. So the guy started this little cottage industry. It's Drexel as this massive short position. Well, Drexel went out of business a couple of years later, so it was Merrill Lynch. Well, then Merrill Lynch got out of the precious metals market, so it was JP Morgan. Now it's Barclays Bank. You know, it's this movable feast that has involved hundreds of people and, and numerous companies, and this short position is going to blow up and the price of silver is gonna rise sharply any moment. And you can look from the late 1980s up until now, and it's going to blow up at any moment, and the price of silver is going to skyrocket, except that it doesn't exist and it hasn't blown up, and the price of silver hasn't skyrocketed. People conspiracy, and they're not limited to gold and silver. And people like this have been around since Roman times, um, so we're not going to get rid of them. Now, one of my pet peeves for those of you who have listened to me for years is geopolitics are not international politics. Geopolitics is a term that was coined by a British person back at the turn of the last century to sort of justify colonialism. It has to do with politics, a theory that politics uh, are influenced by geographic factors that the, and he actually talked about the Ukraine uh, and Ukrainian people and the nature of their geographic location as being indicative of the organization of their government. The Nazis used it to, to sort of say, hey, yeah, we're special. We're going to storm over the world. 
because geopolitically, that's what we should do. Geopolitics are not international politics. This is a semantic issue, but it's a semantic issue that bugs me. Another one is the existential threat. Now, the Globe Post a couple of years ago posted a really good article about the existential threat of existential threat rhetoric. Existentialism is a philosophical theory or a belief or an approach to life that emphasizes that the individual is a free and responsible for himself or herself agent, and he or she determines the development of their own lives through conscious acts and, and decisions. So an existential threat would be an overwhelming or debilitating uh, realization that you know life has no grand meaning other than that you should take responsibility to maximize uh, the value of your life and the, the, uh, the usefulness and enjoyability of your life, your life, your liberty, and your pursuit of freedom, uh, and that it's your job. An existential threat is a realization that maybe that's not the case, right? So again, you know, when people talk about the existential threat of this or that or the other thing, you know, bad. Now this is an Oreo. And you know, Oreos used to be uh, used as a pejorative term because you know, you break these black sides out and there's this white stuff in the center. But I started using it this week uh, to refer to Democrats because you, know, you look at this white stuff, and it's supposed to be food. We'll set this aside for later. It's supposed to be food. It, you know, God knows what it is. Uh, actually, it's on the package. It's uh, cooking oil and, and sugar. Uh, it's, you know, it's not toxic, <laughs> but you probably really, uh, it's junk food, right? And, and I realized that the Oreos are pretty good uh, metaphor for the Democratic Party, because on the outside, it looks hard, you know, you can hit it and stuff, but in, in the, in, in, inside, it's just like this toxic junk food with no value to human life. And that's sort of where we are uh, with the Democratic Party. Again, just sort of off of it. Now, hyperbole has killed more people than Cecil B. DeMille. And for those of you who are not cinephiles or 120 years old, Cecil B. DeMille used to make these classic movies in which hundreds and thousands of people were, were slaughtered. Uh, you know, things about the Bible and biblical times and stuff like that. I talked on the 26th of April, we titled that uh, presentation, Alarmism is Always Destructive of Wealth. And in the ensuing two, three weeks, things have just gotten that much worse. So you're hearing about hyperinflation. You're hearing about a 70, 80, or 90% market crash. You know, there's a major recession imminent if it hasn't already started your money will be worthless. The dollar is going to collapse, you know? And then there's all this apologia for an autocratic militaristic Russia. Oh yeah, you know, who cares what's happening with democracy in the Ukraine and the slaughter of people and the destruction of, of, a, of a country, you know, because hell, it's causing a shortage of potash in the wheat fields of Canada and that's gonna cost me more money, you know? but Let's go through some of these. Before I do, because I'm in such a happy mood today, I want to refer to William Butler Yeats. He wrote this poem called The Second Coming. He wrote it in 1919, after the destruction that was brought onto the world by World War I. And I underlined a few lines that are important. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed on the world. And said, importantly, the best of us lack all conviction, while they're those Oreos, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I think other people have said, anytime you find somebody who's got a passionate intensity about something, you should be suspicious of them. Uh, but that's where it is. And then at the end of the poem, there's a second verse. What rough beast 
its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. I, you know, it, it's Yeats. It's 1919, it's post-World War One. it's very powerful. Joan Didion, who uh, wrote a book, uh, article called Slouching Toward Bethlehem about the hippie movement in Haight-Ashbury in 1967, she called it Slouching Toward Bethlehem, and she started it with the words, the center will not hold. But it did. It held in 1919, it held in 1967, it held in 2020, and it's probably gonna hold in 2022. That's what life is all about. The center did hold, and it tends to hold. So when you hear this hyperbole, take a deep breath, or better yet, turn off the internet and go for a walk. Now, there is inflation, and then there is hyperinflation. And Philip Kagan, back in the 50s, defined hyperinflation. He was the economist who came up with the term and said, hyperinflation is a month where the monthly inflation rate exceeds 50%. I think that's kind of an excessive number, but he was looking at what hyperinflation was. And that's the number that he came up with. So you hear these guys waving their arms talking about hyperinflation. Here we are. <clears throat> we have had inflation over 2% for 14, 14 months now. 14 months of inflation over 2%. We've had six months where it's been more than 5%. It is way down from the 5 to 14% that we saw persistently from the late 1960s through 1979, 1982. And it is even lower than what we saw back in um, the late 40s and, and, and early 50s. So we're not into a hyperinflationary period. We have an inflation problem, which we've talked about ad nauseum, but we also have an inflation problem with the terminology because you've got all these guys trying to get you to buy gold and silver at inflated prices, waving their arms, saying that we're into hyperinflation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's a different chart. This is a different way of looking at inflation. This is the purchasing power of a dollar for held by a U.S. consumer. So it's basically the inverse of the consumer price index. And this one goes back to 1913. And I use it because it's very exemplative. Again, you can see the 1970s, you can see the late 1940s and early 1950s, and you can see the high inflation that led to the Great Depression, that big spike 15, 16, you know, 18% inflation that was the pro part and parcel with the problems that created the Great Depression. And then during the Great Depression, you had about an 18% uh, increase in the purchasing power uh, of the dollar because inflation plunged because no one had any money to buy anything. So if you had money, you could buy whatever you wanted which actually ties in with gold and silver investing because in 2005, 2006, we were talking to our clients and we were saying, you know, hey, they were saying, oh, wow, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, I thought the world was collapsing, but you were right, Jeff, it didn't. And we're in a nice uh, recovery here and things are rolling along really well. So what's going to go wrong? And we said, it's going to be a debt bomb and it's going to be nasty and it's going to be in the next few years. And there are three things that you should do. You should reduce your debt, you should build up on cash, and you should buy gold. And you should build up on cash because when that debt bomb blows up and you go into a recession, things are gonna be really cheap and you wanna buy things. You wanna buy stocks in mining companies, you wanna buy stocks in other companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a very good, uh, investment policy to always have, reduce your debt, build up on cash, and buy gold. Uh, but that's the way it is. But the reality is, again, yes, we have an inflation problem, but it's not a hyperinflation problem. In fact, you can go back to the, the roaring 20s. And even then, we didn't have an inflation, hyperinflation problem. We had inflation problems, 
which led to the Great Depression, but it wasn't hyperinflation. And you know, these guys really ought to read a book or two so they know what they're talking about. I've shown you this chart, I'll show it to you again, because a lot of their theory is that with money supply so high, and there have been so much money pumped into the economy, you have to have hyperinflation. And you can see here that, you know, money supply increases have presaged nine of the past one recession, uh, periods of inflation. You know, the correlation since 1982 of inflation and money supply is not what these guys say it is. Yeah, there's a relationship. And yes, a lot of monetary accommodation does contribute to the inflation that's being caused by really economic trends in the supply and the demand for goods and services. But high growth rates of money supply do not necessarily presage periods of high inflation or hyperinflation. Take a deep breath and stop listening to those people. Let's talk about the economy. I showed you this chart a couple of weeks ago. This is US real GDP. We had a negative 1.4% decline in the first quarter. Mostly that reflected a decline in inventories held by companies, and that reflected supply constraints and supply chain constraints, not only shipments from China and other places, but also shipments across the country because of a lack of truck drivers and an insufficient uh, rail service. Another indicator that we're, you know, not, we're heading toward uh, late stages of an economic expansion, but we still have a lot of rope left before we have to worry about a recession. This is capacity utilization. And you have the gray areas are recessions, and you can see how capacity utilization goes way above 80% in most, or slightly above 80%, above 80% in the periods leading up to recessions. And you can see now that we're getting up to about 77% capacity utilization. And you can also see that in the past two periods when we got up to 79 and 80% capacity utilization, we didn't actually go into a recession. So there's a lot of slack left in the economy. We have supply constraints, we have very high demand, partly because of the monetary law just partly because investors are taking money that they, you know, they've stuffed themselves with stocks and bonds, and now they're buying real estate and turning it into rental properties and screwing people to the wall. Um, and a few of these guys who used to work at Goldman Sachs and then the U.S. Treasury uh, <clears throat> are involved in that business. Uh, you know, we have these kinds of problems, but there is a lot of slack that says, yeah, there is probably going, there is going to be a recession. There's a 100% chance of a recession. Question is when and where, and it's probably not imminent. So a little bit of perspective helps. Interest rates, we've talked about this over and over again. Wow, a 50 basis point increase in interest rates. Yes, that's, that's off of the floor. And you know, if we keep going at this rate pretty soon, we will be lower than we've been at any time prior to 1993. So there's a lot of slack left in interest rates before you start seeing a negative implication, uh, major negative implication. And then the stock market. The stock market has plunged this week. It hasn't been this low since March. How do gold marketeers handle that? In the markets. This came from one of the more prominent precious metals marketing outlets this morning. Look at this, the Dow is off 3%. Oh my God, the S&P is off 3.6%. Oh my God. All the way back to where it was in March. Perspective helps a lot. So now, next week, May 10th, Silver Yearbook, be there. It's going to be very interesting. The briefing, order the book. There's a tremendous amount, 230 pages worth of information that you'll find. We have a lot of sponsors. We're adding a few more over the next couple of days. Uh, we're very happy to have these guys there. And we're very happy uh, to see it spread across the industry from producers to processors, to fabricators, to investment groups. 
also be at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. And it's interesting because, you know, this guy tried to sandbag me and he's such a inexpert sandbagger. So he asked me to be on a silver panel with Jeff Clark. I said, sure. And then he invited a couple of these more uh, would be silver commentators uh, that uh, to join the panel so they can ask me tough questions. And hopefully I'll ask them tough questions too. Yeah, they would do really well to buy the silver yearbook next year, next week, and study it really hard so that we can have a substantive conversation about the real silver market. And if they want, I can tear apart their conspiracy theories too. I'll also be talking about gold sil and silver supplies, reserves in the ground and inventories above ground. Uh, the Yukon Mining Alliance has asked me to speak about gold. So I'll be giving a gold talk there too. And then we're going to have this open forum question and answer session. It's apart from the VRIC, but it's there. They, they're supplying a room. It'll be six to seven o'clock on Tuesday, the 17th of May. And you know, no formal presentation. We'll, I'll be there and people can ask me questions and we can have a discussion about substantive things. If, you know, I've done this for years at the old Silver Summits. Uh, I did it last year at the Silver Symposium in Coeur d'Alene, uh, the replacement effort for the Silver Summit. We've done it in other times. We do it online with our clients. We did a, a, a few free online uh, when we first started doing the online ones. Uh, they can be very interesting. Back in the Silver Summit days, these things would sometimes run three, four, five hours long. Discussions about everything from how the US Treasury handles its gold and silver and where the silver comes from for coins and um, all sorts of good issues. So this one is just an hour long. The VRIC ends the day at 6 p.m. and I have an engagement at 7 p.m. So there's an hour there for an open uh, forum Q&A, and hopefully none of those scurrilous pig dogs will come in and interrupt us the way one of them did at the uh, Silver Symposium. Silver yearbook's coming up. You really should get it. And like I said, the guys who think they want to challenge me on uh, substance, they should re get it and read it and study it because it's the way it is. When my one son, when my sons were very young, one of them went online and saw some really stupid, unsupportable comments about me from a group that claimed a gold conspiracy. And that group was really funny because, well, I won't go into the details about them. But he said, you know, Jeff, they use Don Quixote, uh, the man of La Mancha, as their symbol. And I said, yes, I, I know that. He said, do they realize that in the book, Don Quixote was insane, and he thought windmills were knights in shining armor to be challenged with his lance. I said, I don't know that they know that, and I don't care to know it, but yeah. Hey, May 10th, Silver Year book, BRIC 17th and 18th, 3 p.m. open forum for clients on May 25th, the Silver Online Seminar, which will be open to the public on June 1st. A lot coming up uh, with a fair bit focusing on silver, but also gold and other commodities. You can go to our website, read all about us, order some of our reports, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. In the meantime, take care, be good. Be good to yourself, but be good to other people too, because democracy in Ukraine is important to democracy in the United States.